uh, I have gone through some uh, submissions, fairly well written, I have taken out some four printouts. What I will be doing is the following. So, this is a surprise presentation test, you may call it. I will pick out some submissions randomly and invite those people to come here and speak on what they have written. Since they have written whatever they have written very recently, it should be reasonably fresh in their mind. So, they should be able to state that it is not expected that you should repeat exactly what you have written that is not required at all. You might like to tell it as a short story. So, you just have to tell your summary and your critique roughly what you have written. Of course, I will have the advantage of reading what you have written. Uh, this is not an examination. So, uh, if at all you do not match anything that you have stated, but use your own words to express yourself is ok. Very obviously, this is not going to be an example of a prepared presentation. A prepared presentation is one in which you spend time, you rehearse what you want to speak at home and then come and make a presentation. So, this is more like an impromptu conversation. The idea here is to remind ourselves that while formally we would be making very many prepared presentations, there are umpteen occasions in life, in fact more than the occasions for formal presentations, where in informal discussions you communicate your ideas, your thoughts to others. And the point is even in that informal communication, you should generally attempt to be as effective as you are when you are prepared to speak. So, this is an example not all of us would be able to do that. Some of us are good storytellers, some others are reticent and, and speak very little, but the idea is to open up and try to say things. So, treat this as a sort of short storytelling session. I will time you, you are not limited, generally try to limit yourself in about 3 to 5 minutes because to read one page actually will take less than 5 minutes. But since you won't have the advantage of having your own page in your hand, okay, you would be reciting from memory. Since I am going to pick up people randomly, I will give you a few minutes to think and recall what you have written and what you have seen, so that you are ready for that. Is that okay? So, about 2 or 3 minutes. I must also tell you that I am glad on one more uh, for one more reason. Today I found a lot more people physically present at 9 30 in the class. So, things are improving I suppose. There are still occasions like our friends are just walking in. <laughs> you had a class? 8 30 lecture? Oh, you had? <laughs> no, not bad. And what about him? He is looking somewhere else. You also had a lecture? No. Okay. About 12 years ago in one of my classes, I had put a box outside. Any late comer had to put in a 10 rupee note inside in order to attend the class. And that money was distributed to people who came early. And that that was so effective, very soon I had zero money in the box and all students in the class. <laughs> but that is not a very, I mean that that's that's a very sadistic way of doing things. I would rather see that happening voluntarily. All right then. Uh, so, should I pick out everybody is ready? Oh, those who have come in just late, the idea is I will pick up randomly some submissions and those people will have to come here and present their summary and their critique in their own words in 3 to 5 minutes. And those who cannot remember exactly what they have written, it is ok, but treat it as a short storytelling session about what you felt about the TED talk that you saw. By the way, how was the exercise? Uh, does 
everybody feel that you actually benefited by looking at or reading a lecture or listening to a lecture? So those lectures are good, right? There are 1500 of them. And before beginning these presentation uh, sequences, I would like to tell you one more thing, which is quite important from both the technical writing and reading point of view. You see, because of the net, the amount of overload of information is so much. And it is realizably so much. Earlier also, if you went to a good library, the total number of books, even those on topics in which you have interest, would be so many that if you were to read all the books end to end, it would take a lifetime. Today, even if you want to browse through some of the material, it may take a lifetime. Now, that creates a problem. As I had once mentioned, if you do a Google search, you get how many hits? 100,000, 40,000, 30,000 answers. And what do you read? The answers on the first page. How many of you go to the second and third page of a Google search? Not bad. How many of you read through entire set of first 15 pages? Nobody. So you see, Google is now determining what we should read. You understand that? There's nothing wrong with it. Google is not particularly a bad intentioned group, but it is not a well intentioned group either. In fact, it does not know what exactly I want. It is just looking at a query typically written in a telegraphic English to find out something and give it to you. You are all computer science students, so you would be familiar with the notions of page ranking and web search and so on. Have you done a course? Showman's course, how many of you are doing? Only two. My God, nobody is interested in searching for information useful, it looks like. Or maybe that course is not offered in the first year. Is that a first year course? I am surprised, does Showman teach only two students? It's not possible. How many students are there in that course? Seven zero. One seven. So the remaining 15 are not doing this course, is it? <laughs> okay. Anyway, the point I'm making is there is an overdose of information. And typically what happens psychologically is when I do a Google search, for example, 90 percent of the time I would read through the first set of responses that I get and I'll open up something and read it. And because it comes from the great web, I will assume that that is complete and correct information. Even people who read Wikipedia, now Wikipedia is actually a reasonably filtered set of information. You go to a topic, there is actually a write-up, there are some references and so on. So let me ask you another question. How many of you have read Wikipedia articles on any technical topic? All of you? Yeah, some, some time or the other. Now, how many of you have gone to the references cited in the Wikipedia article and read all references? <laughs> so please understand this. Whenever somebody produces a summary of anything like you have done, the summary is based, in this case, it is based on a single talk. That single talk itself is based on heavy research that the speaker would have done. But scientific method demands that the speaker, or in case of technical writing, the authors list the reference sources. So you have data and information, which is summarized in the form of Wikipedia articles, but you have primary data sources which are listed there. And many times those primary data sources turn out to be not primary. They themselves depend upon something else. This is particularly hazardous when you are looking at historical essays, historical reviews, because history is replete with views which are so contradictory, opinions which are so contradictory, and facts stated as facts which are so contradictory. That is why scientific method demands that all of us go and look at the primary sources of information. So just one hint, whenever you look at a Wikipedia article, 
particularly when you wish to cite a Wikipedia article in any of your writing, do ensure that you look at at least some of the primary sources behind the Wikipedia article and confirm to yourself that what is written in that article is a reasonable reflection of the facts and opinions mentioned in that primary source. That is required. Okay. So by now you would have reversed as a background processing mode, you would have rehearsed whatever you have written, right? So let me pick out some random samples. Okay, so the first person I invite is Prakash Kumar Verma. Uh, the topic of this TED talk was how leaders inspire action. So, means why some leaders are so different? Why do they why do they attract so much attention, so much audience? Why do some organization are so successful, so, so innovative that every product they launch, crowd, crowd go after them? Because they think, they, think, they think differently, they think very different from others. All successful organization, all successful people are very different, but but very same. They are very different from other crowd, which, which are not very successful, but very same with those people who are very successful. They think they think same way. They communicate the same way. And that is very different from others who are not so successful. Most of the people think that, think and market as what we make, how we make. We never know why we make, why we make something. But great leaders, great organizations, they, they don't, they don't think about means uh, audience want this or the market need this. They make something because they believe what we are making, this will change the world. This will change the course, this will change the course of the world. Means like we, we can take the example of Apple. Means world never, means Crowd never wanted a smartphone, but they, they thought that this device will change the world. This device will change the change everything. It will change how we how we see internet, how we see computers. So they made product for that. There is one other example: Martin Luther King. The Americans. Americans never, never came to see him. Martin, Martin Luther, Martin Luther announced, announced that he will deliver a speech. But that time there was no internet there. Then how come, how come they know the exact time, exact date and gathered in such a massive number? They came because they came because they think what Martin Luther means thinking of crowd and thinking of Martin Luther King was same. They didn't came there to, to see Martin Luther King. They came there because they think what Martin Luther King think. So, so this is so this thinking of most phenomenal guys are very different. They, they don't think about audience. They don't want to lure audience. They think that this is right. This, this should, this should happen in society. And people who think the same thing, they follow them. 
so so this this is the gist of all talk Thank you, Prakash Sharma. I now invite uh, Rinku Shah. She has uh, seen the TED talk on the power of introverts. It's very interesting. Good morning, all of you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the title that is "Power of Introverts." Uh, this one is, uh, yeah, it's uh, this talk is given by uh, Suzanne Kane, and. Uh, Basically, the summary on this is like she tries to talk about that intro being an introvert is not being bad. Don't feel bad being an introvert. So, what most people think what an introvert is is a person who is very shy is considered to be an introvert. But uh, what she says is introvert is not about shyness. It's about being alone and uh, not being in groups. You don't love being in groups. You like to be in yourself itself. So, it's not about shyness. So, don't try to compare it as a shy person. And uh, then uh, she tries to talk about like what uh, the current scenario is. Like most of the institutes, schools, workplaces, etc., they uh, always try to uh, hamper the performances of introverts. They try to uh, get extroverts into managerial positions because they think that extroverts are the we people who can do better. But uh, she said uh, through an interesting research by Adam Grant. She says that uh, the Adam Grant has uh, found out that that most introverts turn out to be the best leaders, and the idea behind it is like if you are an extrovert and if you come up with some idea, you try to talk about that idea in front of people, and you're so excited about it, is just uh, don't listen to everybody else. You think that you are what are you thinking is the best, and you try to hamper the uh, ideas of the others, whereas uh, most introverts. Try to think in their own minds. They keep uh, taking ideas from other people, and finally, they can come up with good ideas and uh, can become good leaders. That was the basic summary. Then she also talked about that being an introvert is also not the best thing. Extroverts also have their own uh, good qualities. So at the end, she says she summarizes that you have to be to be a social uh, to get a social uh, performance. Uh, you have to be somewhere between introvert and an extrovert. So that was the basic summary of what she said. And uh, the critics on this is like uh, after listening to the video, I guess every introvert gets motivated and gets uh, relieved of the pain of being sidelined by the society. So that is one uh, good uh, critique on this talk. And secondly, if she would have added something about how to reach that balance between the two, then it would have been useful. That's all about the talk. Thank you. Balancing in life is a perpetual problem. All of us strive to achieve it. Introvert and extrovert. I hope you understand the point that the speaker has made. In the critique that she presented, there is nothing wrong with people who are introverts. There is nothing wrong with people who are extroverts. But just as introverts feel that they are left out, and therefore they need to participate, and by such participation they only expand their own horizon. That is what the author is saying. But what the author or the speaker has not explicitly stated is the requirement for all extroverts of this world. To occasionally sit back and do some introspection, extroverts very rarely do introspection. Most extroverts turn out to be stubborn. They love their own ideas, and they fall in love with themselves. So that is not a good sign. You need to listen to others. You need to have an open mind, and whatever you listen to, you need to reflect upon it back home. So, you see, it's not 24 hours that we are in touch with somebody else or the other. Neither for 24 hours we are isolated. Sometimes we are alone. We have our own private space in our room, wherever. Or we can be alone even in a crowd if we just go into some thinking. And sometimes we are forced to be in crowd, independent of whether I am an extrovert or introvert. I will have to face both the situations, and that is why this balance. 
In fact, the philosophies of the whole world, including the Indian philosophies, suggest that the golden mean in any activity is best. Extreme of any kind is not good. Okay. Let me invite Pankaj Gayakwar, who has written on the topic of a mystery box by J.J. Adams. How many of here have heard the name J.J. Abrams? J.J. Abrams. Uh, he is one of the famous Hollywood movies slash series director. And uh, he has given the talk on the mystery box. Uh, it is about a box given to him by his grandfather when he was uh, some like t uh, teenager or something, 5 or 10. Then uh, he always, um, it, the box always amused him what's inside. Uh, it was a simple box, uh, kind of like this size and uh, he always used to think about what can be inside that box but uh, he never opened that box because uh, he think that the box is the key to the mystery factor the mystery factor is the one which leads to the imagination and creativity the creativity is the f factor in the entertainment industry and in design industry if you think about something something on blank canvas consider like this some blank canvas is there and you have no idea what you are going to do. But if you start asking about questions, what can be designed, how can be designed, which can be factors that I can represent on a blank canvas, then your imagination power starts boosting up. So uh, this is the factor he considered for his uh, entire life, for his career. So as we know, as he is famous, uh, suspense slash a thriller and mystery creator. Uh, all of his movies are based on like mysteries and all. Uh, even if you see one, then you will be eager to watch what can be the sequel. And uh, regarding that box, it is just simple tenants box. Uh, if I keep a box here, empty box, then how many people can imagine that this box is empty? Hardly five or ten percent think that this box is empty. So the people who think that the box is empty, they have stopped imagining anything. They can't imagine that there will be something positive or some good in, can be in that box. So this is kind of negative thinker people. So they cannot lead their imagination power towards its best. So they can just stop thinking. But if you start imagining something good is in that box and if you keep on trying, then many things can possibly fit in that box. You can think about. So these are the things which leads to your creativity. And creativity is the key. Creativity and curiosity is the key in our overall growth. In education, what we are doing? We are asking questions about certain phenomena, how, what, who, why, when. So these questions come from your mind that what can be inside? What, what are the factors behind this phenomena? So like that, if you go on keep things in a mystery mind, and if you go on exploring on the, these things, then certainly at some point, you can come up with good design and uh, Become a good designer and creative thinker. That's all. As I said, there are two interesting aspects. One is sometimes mystery is better than knowledge because it can uh, spawn off a lot of thinking inside. The more important thing is to be imaginative. So you can be imaginative not just about things which are mystical, but even otherwise things which are very visible. And uh, being imaginative is what is required to be creative. Good work. So let us go to the next person. I must admit that the next four are not strictly random samples, because uh, as the submissions were coming late night, uh, I think the flood started around uh, 11.30 in the night, continued. Uh, unfortunately, we had forgotten to set the notification uh, flag properly. So I started receiving mails. And unfortunately, all teachers of that course started receiving mails. So I got a very angry email at 2 o'clock from a teacher saying what is happening. <laughs> um, so let me now invite uh, Bharat Mutukumar. Is Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I had uh, written about uh, Maya Penn, um, a girl who was aged 13 and she gave a talk and she gave it uh, and her talk was available on TED. So the talk begins with an animation 
that she has herself created and uh, it's about malicious dishes the animation says about malicious dishes so malicious dishes is actually a restaurant where there are uh, two people where there's a customer and the waiter and he gives a menu and uh, that malicious dishes that menu consists of uh, dishes like um, corrupted data ram all this like it has a list of uh, corrupted data corrupted ram ram sandwich sprinkled with corrupted data and like that so basically what it says is uh, so then she comes then after that uh, maya comes on stage and she begins like i started drawing since the yeah, since the time i held a crayon so she she likes drawing so she started drawing since the time she held a crayon and she had made animated flip books since she was 4 and she was inspired to become an animator by a tv series which showed that uh, showed jobs that most children don't know about so based on that when she saw that what an animator is animator uh, animator show, uh, makes things that she uh, sees on tv she was inspired to become an animator so then she started creating things and uh, her dad taught her how to rip a computer and to join a computer again assemble reassemble the computer when she was 4 and her journey goes on she went on to be and then uh, her dress comes like uh, she wanted to and there were pieces of fabric around her house she thought okay uh, let me join this let me try to make a ribbon let me try to make a scarf with whatever fabric that was available in her house and she started sporting those some people liked the way she dressed and liked the way that she had made pretty things and that uh, had a, that made her give an idea that uh, that made her and that instigated an idea that let me sell cool stuff that what i make let me sell it so she created a website she learned html5 and she created a website uh, in which she sold her pretty things and that website she made when she was 8 by the time she was 10 forbes magazine contacted her for to feature her in their article in their cover page um, for being the most successful child even though for her business she doesn't know what uh, she doesn't know the dynamics of business she doesn't have a business plan and definitely her parents were behind her to support her all through all through her endeavors the best thing is like she has uh, she is environmentally very keen she she's a keen environmentalist and she wanted to give back to the environment so whatever her proceeds are that comes in through her business 10 to 20 percent she she gives to charities environment environmental charities local and global charities everything so she believes in giving back to the society and whatever clothes she makes are all eco-friendly clothes because there is like uh, the bleach so according to her that uh, clothes that we wear uh, the bleach the dyes and all uh, spoil the environment and uh, that was the reason she made her clothes line which was uh, uh, which are eco friendly so by the age of 13 now she's 13 when she gave the talk in december 2013 she was 13 years of age and uh, she has a company for by her she has a website she she has a clothes line she has a company she learns she's learning python and javascript uh, so she's just developing herself and anyway she is in the forbes list so when so why i took that was when at 13 a little girl like that can do so much and we are at ages of about 25 and we are still at iit and you are listening to me <laughs> so that's it and the best part was the parents did not kill her creativity they, when she was held, holding the crayon and when she was trying to make pretty things her parents did not say okay chodo ab ja ke padho padhai karo no she let okay let her be what she likes let her follow her heart and they just let it and they never thought that okay she has done something are tumne kuch banaya hai wo kahin sale mein to nahi jayega it will not go on sale nobody will sell so they, they did basically what i'm trying to say is they did not suppress her they just let her be so that was something that I liked. So that's it. Thank you. 
as you said, it's truly an inspirational story. In fact, uh, if we look around, we'll find such inspirational people amongst ordinary folks that we know. We generally uh, do not try to find out such things. But these motivations are extraordinary. The bottom line, as he said, and uh, is absolutely right, is that uh, people so young can do so much. Then we have a much greater responsibility to do something much more. It is not people who are young who do so much. You will also come across people who come from such humble backgrounds and have struggled so much in life. And yet, they have achieved extraordinary things. That kind of thing puts a greater onus on us who are perhaps better looked after, thanks to God, thanks to parents, thanks to our own self. We have a greater responsibility to do things. Uh, sometimes there are hazardous mistakes that happen when you write your views. So I'll read out the critique which he has written. The talk is inspirational and motivational. When a girl of just 13 can accomplish so much and give back to the society, it instigates us to take stock of our life. The verb instigate is generally not used in a positive sense. You know, you, you instigate people to do some naughty thing. Like Raj Thakre instigated people to stop all traffic in Mumbai. So I am sure uh, uh, you, you, if this is not what is meant. So you might want to choose a, a better word. By the way, such things happen because, as I said and as you all have noticed, if I write something, it is very difficult for me to correct things, either semantically or syntactically. And that's the reason why it is important that for any technical writer, you always get it read by someone else. The next sentence, in spite of extremely good intentions, has become very funny because of the loss of just one word. The next sentence says, of course, there's her achievements as well as her passion are quite evident from her talk, that is okay. The most important thing I learned was that we should snub out the inherent creativity and inquisitiveness that are present in every child by making them join the rat race for excellence. You get what, what the sentence reads? We should snub out the create inherent creativity and inquisitiveness that are present in every child by making them join the rat race for excellence. They should be given a chance to blossom. That's the next thing. The reader thinks that the only way to blossom is to join rat race. And the only way to correctly shape the minds of young is to do exactly what he said, exactly opposite of what he said and what the talk said. What is the missing word? Not. The most important thing I learned was that we should not snub out. And in this case, I would think that the not deserves to be underlined. That is, that is the important thing. Now again, it is very obvious from his talk that this is not at all what he intended to write. He intended exactly the opposite, but it got written. It not only got written in his handwritten thing, it got typed also. What it means is, when we type, it should not be a blind typist job that we should do, but we should actually read understand and then type and correct ourselves. I had a fantastic uh, typist who was typing my uh, PhD thesis. In those days you did not have Xerox and so on, so PhD thesis had to be typed on a, uh, uh, we, we write with stylus on those uh, cyclo styling, uh, uh, what you call, I forget the name, and then you take cyclo style copies of that. So the writing, uh, typing there is very difficult. You have to remove the ribbon from the typewriter and type it such that it actually works like a stylus. So if you make a mistake, it's very hazardous. You have to put a red ink and then retype and, it's, it's, and you have to take out the whole stencil from the typewriter and so on. Very tough job. So you need a good typewriter. Typist, my typist was good. So while typing, I was sitting next to him. He suddenly smiled loudly and I said, what happened? He says, Professor Fatak, you have written vision twice in the last one page and both the spellings are wrong. 
no, not vision, visual or something. So I said, oh my God, we should stop and correct. He says, no, 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 they have been corrected. He could correct while typing and he was just a typist. That is the kind of skill that we need to acquire. So please correct the not, very important. Okay. Let me invite Deepali Gupta. Good morning, everybody. So the title of my talk is The Magic of Fibonacci Numbers. And it was given by Arthur Benjamin. So he starts by saying that the mathematics today is full of patterns. And what, why we study maths, why most, study, why most students study maths is because they have to pass an incoming exam or they, it will be needed in, in some next class. So we forget to enjoy, we forget the joy in doing mathematics and in finding out patterns. So he presented one very beautiful example and very simple, which is Fibonacci numbers. And it very uh, frequently occurs in nature. Like the number of petals in a flower is a Fibonacci number and the number of spirals that occur in a sunflower is also a Fibonacci number. So he tries to present some of, some more patterns which can be achieved by just these Fibonacci numbers. So as we know, these numbers are just, can just be obtained by adding the previous numbers. But when we, when we look at their squares and try to add them, like 1 plus 1, 1 plus 2 and so on, we get another Fibonacci number. Like 4 plus 1 is 5 and then we add 4 plus 9 which is 13, which is again a Fibonacci number. And then we try to add consecutive squares of these numbers, like 1 plus 1 plus 4, which is 6, which is not a Fibonacci number, but we, when we multiply 2 and 3, which are Fibonacci numbers, we again get a Fibonacci number. So what author tries to present is just by doing this simple arithmetic, we can obtain many beautiful patterns out of these. So what he tries to do is we can learn mathematics not just for application or just for uh, calculations but for inspiration also. We can just try doing some simple arithmetic to see how beautiful nature is, how these beautifully occurring patterns occur in nature. So that, is what, uh, that was the gist of his talk. But I would like to say that what presently students do is they are so busy in making such complicated systems that we just forget, we just ignore these patterns which occur in nature. So that is all. So how many of you know that Fibonacci numbers were not invented by Fibonacci? One, two, three, four. Do you know that more than 300 years before Fibonacci was even born, the Fibonacci sequence and the Fibonacci numbers were extensively discussed in the Indian mathematical literature? So, Hemchandra numbers was the name given one time and now there is proof that even before Hemchandra, in fact Hemchandra himself has quoted somebody else in the literature that he has written. It has been proven that it has been used. The link has also been established that through the Arab traders and the Arab scholars who came here and knew about this work and translated into Arabic and Fibonacci happened to read the Arabian, Arabic uh, 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 works translation into uh, European languages that he came across this and he discovered this. Just to set the record right. In fact, the uh, teacher coordinator of this course, Professor Ram Subramanian, is actually one of the ardent uh, researcher in trying to locate and appropriately allocate the credit for those Indian scientists, particularly mathematicians, who have actually discovered or invented a whole lot of things. Just for your information, I thought I'll let you know. Those of you who are interested might read the Wikipedia article on Fibonacci series and the associated cross-references. You'll find a lot of things here. Let me uh, quickly uh, invite Rahul Dev Parashar. Good morning everyone, uh, the talk was about do school skill creativity. So in that talk, speaker says that uh, nowadays schools are more focusing on the 
like uh, only education not on the creativity these both things are completely different like uh, part of body one side is creativity one side is educational like whatever we are learning things so what we are taught like mathematics and all the basic thing basic things but uh, not how to be creative so a child is like not afraid of an doing anything uh, and he is creative in doing everything but we are killing killing the creativity so he takes a story that uh, he takes few examples about uh, showing that child some more creative and by the age of 15 they uh, lost mo most of their creativity finally he takes some uh, random examples but uh, i don't think they are related with this uh, theme like schools are uh, killing creativity and uh, he says that uh, the uh, job of the schools are only producing, producing uh, university professors i don't think it's a well said thing so my critic on this is uh, pointage find that schools are create, killing creativity but uh, we can't say that we should remove the educational system because it's providing the fundamental for students to build other things on that if we don't provide this educational system and uh, let them uh, do whatever they want to do then uh, we can't uh, give them a flow like to learn or uh, anything so saying that we should remove the education system is not a good idea on that basis and saying that uh, the job of the school is only to produce the university professor is i don't think it's any way correct finally he makes one more point that uh, funny point that uh, men on earth are uh, killing other species if we remove men from earth then earth will be more uh, flourish then it's now so it's i think well said okay so thank you everybody who participated uh, i would just take two more minutes to emphasize a few things one is that you would notice that in an impromptu conversational speaking like we just organized it here uh, people spoke but everybody who spoke here would have gone back and felt that he or she would have done better had she rehearsed a bit more that is the point i wanted to make that in formal presentations you have to prepare yourselves and that preparation has to be fairly thorough including a rehearsal i would suggest two rehearsals one alone in front of a mirror preferably with a tape recorder which is what i did by the way i think i mentioned when i was a young teacher and the second in front of a small group so that the near perfection is achieved the second thing which professor prakash with the noted with great delight i agree with him that at least the samples that we have got so far the more or less they are not on heavy technical aspects so there are n number of technology related uh, ted talks but most people have preferred human related ted talks which shows that humanity among us is alive and that's a great thing that that's a great thing to understand so with this we close this session the next week is mid sem there is uh, no mid sem i repeat so relax and do your uh, work and we will meet immediately after the mid sem where i'll announce the progression for the remaining thing